From Relay FM, this is Upgrade, episode 486 for November 13th, 2023. This episode is brought to you by ExpressVPN, ZocDoc, Factor, and Oracle. My name is Mike Hurley, and I'm joined by Jason Snell. Hello, Jason. You know, Mike, uh, Upgrade 486 is good, but wait until we get to Upgrade Pentium. Oh, man, it's going to oh, be fast. Is that a Power PC joke? It's a, no, it's an Intel uh, joke. The PC okay. list, the, our, all of our Windows users know what I'm talking about, huh? <laughs> Woo! Windows! Yeah, okay. All of those four people got the joke. It was a chip. Uh, that was the that was the chip for mm. Intel before the Pentium was a 486. Yeah. I have a snow talk question for you. Comes from mm-hmm. Tom, who wants to know. When you put your iPhone into a MagSafe stand for using standby, so you have it on the whole horizontal, which orientation is it? Volume buttons up or volume buttons down? Um, I think it's... Uh, so what I do is I take it out of my hand and I, I rotate it counterclockwise. So I guess the answer there is that side button up, volume buttons mm. down, camera bump up, but it's mostly just a... I'm. I mean, it's really. I think ergonomically, I'm walking over to the the stand, which is in my kitchen, and I, 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 my hand. You know, I'm holding it. I think, even though I'm usually a, a left hander, I think I put it in the stand with my right hand, and I, I rotate it counterclockwise. So yeah. So I guess I never really think about it, honestly. I'm using it more though. Here's a funny thing, Mike. Mm-hmm. I, I'm using the. Um, I have the Studio Neat little uh, wooden, very nice wooden thing that holds a MagSafe puck. It's beautiful. I forget yep. the name of it, but material dot. It's just, uh, it's yeah, but it's just a little tiny one. Yep. It's just a little. That, they're all material dock, and then they have different. Ah, names. I see. Here's the problem: the camera pump on the iPhone 15 is so big that in order to get it on the charger, you basically need to put it on the charger and then just slide it until it hits the camera bump, and that's yeah. pretty much where the MagSafe charge is. Yeah. Yeah, it's huge. So because um, well, this is a thing with the the Apple one, right? The little um, the fold out travel guy. That like right. it doesn't the, sit completely flat anymore because yeah. the camera bump is so big. Yeah, so that that I uh, I have occasionally not set it properly, and my phone has not had battery. Um, so I'm using that and that, and also for standby, I'm using uh, the stand a little bit more because standby is cool. And in fact, it I uh, my standby started doing a thing I hadn't ever noticed it doing before this weekend. Came out on Saturday morning to make the tea, and. Um, there was on the phone, instead of what it usually is, which is the time and the weather, it was a live activity that had started from the TV app telling me that Arsenal was playing and that Good it was news. currently nil-nil in the, it, with like 30 minutes or 20 minutes in. I uh, haven't seen a live I was like, activity oh. on, on, I've realized that now because I remember that was yeah. the thing that they announced. I have not seen I, one. I, I think I think it's in, enabled in the beta. I think this must be enabled in the beta because I'm on the beta on my phone, and I don't think I don't think I've ever seen a completely unbitten live activity start for a sports team, and I saw it all weekend. Um, I also saw it at times that I didn't want to see it, and you kind of have to manage that. But uh, where they're like, "Hey, the Warriors are starting," and I'm like, "You know, I like the Warriors, but I, I also like to see the time." But for the for Arsenal, it was great because because I as a uh, American middling uh, fan of soccer. Um, I never remember when they're playing and when they're playing at six in the morning, I don't really try very hard to get up, but because of our time change and all that, I've been getting up earlier lately. And I was like, Oh, I'll turn it on <laughs> while I, you know, while I drink my tea in bed in the morning at six thirty in the morning, I'll turn on Arsenal. So I did anyway. So live activity fired off. That was kind of fun too. So I, I, I enjoy being able to explore this feature. Um, and, and so I've been trying to use standby more. So that's been fun. I love standby. Uh, I am volume buttons on the top. I have no reason why. That's just how I put it in no, every time. No, I, I have I have no opinion or reason, and everything wants to be like fight me. This is what the right way is to do it, and I just I don't have any reason and don't care. But but that is I'm just but reporting the, the facts here. That seems to be how I'm doing it for now. Mm-hmm. If you would like to send in a question to help us open an episode of Upgrade, just go to upgradefeedback.com and you can send in a snow talk question of your own. I have a reminder for you, Upgradians. Oh. The Upgradies, the 10th annual Upgradies, are coming soon. 
Within just a couple of weeks' yeah. time, the nominations will close on December 5th. Please go to Upgradies.vote and make your nominations for the 10th Annual Upgradies Awards. This is your duty as an Upgradian to make these nominations to help Jason and I award our favorites in many categories in early December. Please go to right. Upgradies.vote and enter your nominations. There's a whole compilation process that happens, but I did a little automation I showed you last week that I think is going to help speed things up a little bit, which is great. Because it usually still, takes a really long time, so I'm excited it, it about it. It does. It still in. does, but it'll be it'll be a little bit faster. But yeah, but get those in now. We want to hear from you. While we're in this portion of the show, I will also remind you, if you would like longer, ad-free version of the show each and every week, along with tons of other benefits of being a Relay FM member, like access to the Relay FM members Discord, which is a cool place to hang out, and where all the live discussion happens when we record live every week, go to getupgradeplus.com. It's just five dollars a month or fifty dollars a year. A bargain, I would say, mm, to get really? no ads and longer episodes each and every week. On this week's Upgrade Plus segment, we're going to be talking about a selection of home kit updates that Jason has for me, which mm. I'm very excited to hear all about. It's true. It's true. And we have some follow-up. So I wanted to know from you, Jason, right? So when we recorded last time, you just published the reviews of the MacBook Pro. And yeah. I feel and like... the iMac. And the iMac, of course. And I feel like over the last couple of years, every time Apple releases a new laptop or a new... Actually, any of the Apple Silicon products, there is the review process. They go out in the world. Yep. And we talk about it. People make the reviews, make their assumptions. Then it feels like the conversation shifts. Yes. In a way that always makes me feel uncomfortable because it's like we talk about these things, we have our opinions, or, you know, we'll talk to, I'll talk to you, you have your opinion, it helps form my opinion, and that's the conversation that we have. But then there tends to be this like, but what about the thermals? Or like there was a question that we had right. on last week's episode, which is like, we had no experience or information about the Pro Chip, for example. That was just like a nebulous right. thing out there. Or like I think back to the Ultra when it was like, oh, the Ultra is really powerful, super cool. And then it's like, but the Mac Pro has no graphics cards, right? And so like then this like conversation kind of like moves. And so I just wanted to ask you, have you had any further opinions based on how the conversation has gone over the last <laughs> well, week? It's an interesting effect, and I think it's a combination of things. First off, it's like, you know, we have our opinions, and I, I have, you know, done my uh, due diligence as a reviewer, and I have opinions. And then you get down to the wider world, and there's it naturally different people are going to get different systems. They're going to have different needs. They're going to have different perspectives. I think that's all great. I do also think there's a tendency, though, for the Internet to have a discourse that happens that includes people grinding all the axes that they want to grind. Um, and it's, you know, it's not, I don't love it, but like, it's, that's what it is. That's the internet. It's going to do that. And people are going to do that. And, and, and websites are going to write clickbaity articles to try and create new gates and new anger because it is, uh, you know, better than a shrug. Right. And honestly, I feel like my reviews were kind of shrugs and a lot of the reviews were kind of shrugs. And in that uh, kind of environment where it's just like it's a speed boost and here's the deal and otherwise these things are unchanged and, you know, it, it basically is a vacuum into which ta hot takes and uh, gripes and things can fill that void and there are a lot of people who want to fill them. And again, I, I I don't love them personally, but it is a natural part of the, of the process, I think. Um, the part of the discourse that I don't, particularly love in the last week has been about that base model m3 macbook pro and the reason i don't i understand it even though i don't love it what what i don't love about it is it's very idealistic and like you know idealism good good on you but i've heard a lot of but it's called macbook pro and if it's called macbook pro with the word pro in it it should insert what you think is the pro defining category defining feature it should have 16 gigs of ram it should have a bigger ssd it should have more ports it should support two external displays there's a whole lot of it shoulds and and the the, the challenge with that is that it doesn't mean anything pro doesn't mean anything um there's an ipad pro right there's a <laughs> there's a pro chip now for the iphone uh you know it, because there's a pro iPhone, 
What does it all mean? And the answer is, it means what you want it to mean. It means what Apple wants it to mean. Apple generally has meant it's nicer. You know, there is no definition of what a pro laptop is. So it's all in the eye of the beholder. Um, and so if you have a particularly idealistic view, I mean, first off, you're a, you're a pretty hardcore computer nerd at that point to have an idealistic view of what a computer spec should be. Um, doesn't, I'm just saying, you know, it, it, it is coming from a very particular perspective. I'm not saying it's right or wrong, just saying it's a particular perspective. What I would say, though, is that what frustrates me about that discourse, because it's very much strongly implied that, like, Apple is making a huge mistake because they call this system pro, but they don't dare to make it a properly pro system because it doesn't meet my standards. And then there's the reality, right? And the reality, again, and I'm trying to not take this as like I'm taking Apple's side because that's not it. But I am on the side of reality. I do think it's worth pondering reality and not just living in idealism. And in reality, that base 14, that base 14 inch MacBook Pro with the M3 chip instead of the MP3 Pro and with eight gigs of RAM exists for the exact same reason that the dumb 13 inch touch bar MacBook Pro that we all complained about because it was so inferior to the actual MacBook Pro models, it's the same reason that that thing existed. And it's it's an ugly reason, but it's the truth. It's filthy commerce, right? Uh, Apple isn't going to compromise on its margins. Apple knows that there is a market for a sub $2,000 MacBook Pro that they need to hit because there are people who will who insist on buying something with the label Pro but won't spend two grand on it. And this isn't somebody who's a legitimate pro who's who spends 1800 This is a corporate buyer or somebody who wants something nice and is willing to buy something with terrible specs or with a touch bar. For but they're they're not going to spend two thousand dollars on that laptop. It's going to be thirteen hundred or now maybe sixteen hundred. That's it. So these products are completely not I mean, I don't know how to how to put it. These these products are not what we would ideally call a pro level system. The touch bar MacBook Pro certainly wasn't that, and yet it existed for two chip generations. Why is it? Because Apple knows that people want to buy something called MacBook Pro, and Apple is not willing to compromise on its margins. Remember also that that the new design for the M1 MacBook Pro, right? Every time you iterate uh, as Apple an existing product, the margins go up, right? So after two iterations with M3, they were able to get uh, something with that screen and that, you know, that beautiful 14 inch screen down to still only $15.99, not down to $13, you know, $12.99 or whatever, $15.99. So it's still a, a price increase, but like clearly they are fighting margin and they're not willing to give up their margin. And we could argue like, oh, Apple should, uh, in order to service the word pro, Apple should give up its margins and sell computers at cost because you can't use the word pro. And like, okay, again, I'm not going to say they're wrong. I'm going to say that that's not a realistic view of how the world works. And if you want to believe that, yes, Apple should not call it pro, okay. Or Apple should not, should include more RAM in it at the same price, which is going to hurt their margins. Or, or I mean... My, my problem is that I don't know what the answer is that those people are seeking. Is it Apple gives up their margins? Is it Apple, because that's not realistic, again. Is it Apple should not call any laptop under $2,000 Pro? Anything without 16 gigs of RAM or more and a Pro processor? Is that the answer? Uh, that feels very let them eat cake to me. Um it, it does it, it as a pro user. Does it make you feel better that there isn't some substandard computer that somebody buys that they can call pro like your computer is pro and they've sort of let the rabble in the door? I mean, it frustrates me when I hear some of these arguments. Um, or should Apple eat its margins because there is some group of users who thinks that uh, 16 gigs of RAM should be the minimum and that nobody should ever uh, be forced, I guess, to buy a computer with less than that? Um, or should these computers just be priced out of what some group of people can afford? Also keep in mind, Apple will probably lose sales. I think Apple will lose some sales by making the base model $15.99 instead of $12.99. They will get some new sales and they'll convert some to MacBook Air sales, but they'll also lose some sales from whoever, you know, whatever corporations are like, no, we're not going to, we're not going to go that in that low and we're not going to buy a MacBook Air. Anyway, I, I hear the idealism. I get it. We all agree 
more RAM is better, more storage is better. More external monitors are better. But we also live in the real world, and I think understanding why Apple does what it does, and like I, I, I think I think the attack here is not on that model for being that base model for being underpowered. Um, I think I think it exists because of the people who are buying it, and Apple knows that. Apple knows exactly who's buying it. And that the, the truth is Apple always, I, I would say, prices their products uh, with a base model that is poor <laughs> because they want to hit a price point, right? They want to hit $9.99 or $10.99 or $15.99. And they know that somebody's going to upgrade the RAM. And we all know that that RAM upgrade for $200 is way overpriced for what it should be, in our opinions, given the rest of the, the RAM market. I I get the raging, I guess, but it frustrates me because it strikes a, me as that a lot of it is sort of naively idealistic. And it's like, well, sure, I want to I want an M3 Max for a thousand dollars, but like that's not going to happen. So I, I understand the frustration here, but it's also uh, just to wrap it up. It's not new. Uh, I'll just say that again. The, this is the exact same thing as the dumb 13 inch touch bar MacBook Pro. It's the exact same reason. It is a substandard computer for what's on the label because some people buy the label. That's what it is. It's not great. Um, my review, I really I really don't think that um, most people who care enough to be concerned about the 8 gigs of RAM should buy it regardless. I think they should buy the base model of the M3 Pro because it's not that much more money. And if you've got a few hundred dollars more, you're going to get more RAM and you're going to get the better chip. But I know why this product exists. This product, I mean, honestly, this product isn't for nerds who care about specs. It's not. It's for corporate buyers and other people who refuse to buy a MacBook Air because it's a baby computer, even though it's not. And because this is a pro computer, because it's called pro. Even though, yes, I think we can all agree that in an ideal world, a computer spec like this shouldn't be called MacBook Pro. I get it. But it frustrates me because I don't think those arguments are living in the real world very well put i think the only thing that i would add is kind of like building on what you were saying about like uh being realistic and the product naming i feel like pro for apple lives on this kind of scale now of mentality to branding and so i've kind of listed down all of the products that i can think of that apple is called pro in recent memory from like at the very beginning of this list this is pro by mentality to the end of this mm -hmm. list, this is Pro by branding. So you've yes. got Mac Pro, iMac Pro, MacBook Pro, iPad Pro, iPhone Pro, AirPods Pro. When you get down to that very end, the AirPods Pro, that is not a professional product. Like <laughs> these are my a professional, professional AirPods, would Mike. not use AirPods my, in mm -hmm. their work, right? Like no. the, because they're Bluetooth headphones, they have latency, and or they don't sound as good as other products on the market. Yeah, and you Mac can't pros, plug them into a lossless source yeah. and all those things. Mac right? Pros are literally only bought by professionals because you right. would be out of your mind to do it otherwise, right? Especially now. Right. And then in I would the middle, question that iMac Pro. Remember when the iMac Pro came out and people said, How can this be considered pro? It doesn't yeah. have slots. But it was though, okay. right? Like what, over its life, the we Xeon learned processors it was for, for, sake, for yeah. professionals. And then when you get into the middle, the MacBook Pro and the iPad Pro, they are products that professionals in the class that would buy this product would buy, right? So you get like the right. expensive MacBook Pros, the expensive iPad Pros used by people doing professional work, whether it's like artists for the iPad Pro or it's coders for the MacBook Pro. But both the MacBook Pro and the iPad Pro is where things start to shift, where these products are bought by people who are doing consumer level work on yeah. them. That's why they're game demos about yes. the MacBook Pro, right? Like the and you, and you think to yourself, well, you're buying a seven thousand dollar MacBook Pro to play games, and the answer is no, you're not. You're buying a fifteen ninety nine MacBook mm -hmm. Pro to play games, or maybe a two thousand dollar MacBook Pro to play yep. games. And people do, and and they're allowed to, right? They don't have to show their Pro card and say, yes, I realize that eight gigs of RAM is not enough. Uh, they they don't have to do that. Just they can just buy it because they want it because it's nice because that is definitely one of our listeners did their whole thesis on this and sent it sent it to me. I actually have a copy of his thesis. I I forget his name now, but um, <laughs> yeah. it was it was absolutely uh, you know it means that it's nice. It was Taylor listener Taylor. Is that the one we were quoted in? in? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was cool. 
Yeah, but it, it's so it's a signifier. It doesn't always mean what you even. And this is the thing about branding, right? All of us get to decide what the brand means to us. All yeah. of us do, yeah. right? The the mistake is when you believe that that is what it means to or should mean to everyone because it, it a good chance it doesn't, right? MacBook Pro and iPad Pro are great examples, Mike. Of uh, I know it says Pro on it, and you may be a pro who uses it for professional reasons, but that's not always what it means. And also, like the the other part of this, like this like scale of branding versus mentality that I'm thinking about, people know where they sit in this and then you make the decisions right so like if you want macbook pro for the branding then you'll get the entry level but if you're a professional you know what you're buying right like yeah. if you are a like profession you need professional scale computer you do not buy the yeah. entry level macbook so pro like you're not buying it right because you should know what you need to do your work. Like, you're not going to be like, oh, it says pro on it. It's definitely going to be okay for me. Like, you're a professional, right? That like, you understand what you need from your tools. You're a professional. Um, right. One of, one of the problems that I've had in the last week is hearing and reading professionals who are expert computer users who are probably going to buy, if they buy in this generation, the M3 Max macbook pro mm -hmm. saying essentially you know i know they didn't say it this way but this is how i read it essentially apple shouldn't sell eight gigs of ram as the base model because some people are too dumb to know that that's not enough that's how i read it yeah and it's like you know what they're not too dumb they have a budget or they don't care. And will it mean that their computer runs a little slower when they've got lots of Chrome tabs? Yes, it will. It's not ideal, but we don't live in that ideal world. We just don't. And the alternative, I don't like the alternative, which is no, 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 no. If you don't have $2,000 to buy a MacBook Pro, you shouldn't buy a MacBook Pro. Mm. It shouldn't be labeled that way. It's like, yeah. Well, no. Well, <laughs> Apple's well, decided no. The market has decided no. It's not going to happen. And like I said, Apple's not going to sell 16 gigs of RAM for for 15.99. They're not. Maybe 16.99 or 17.99. Like if they made it the base, it would probably be 16.99. I'm sure they looked at that and they decided like, no, that kills too much of our market because there's a market down there that doesn't want to spend a lot of money but wants Pro as the label. And that, you know they're gonna get it one way or another. At least the touch bar is gone. Like this is way too big of a conversation for today. I feel like, and I'm just gonna say this and move on. Uh, I feel like too much discourse today online is focused around fake people that people create in their minds uh, and yeah. then make arguments sure. for that person that doesn't exist. Right. Brock wrote in to say, to further <laughs> add to the confirmation that the plans for the bigger iMac is likely dead, the text for the iMac shown in the banner of Apple's Mac page on their website was updated to say I'm from iMac 24 to simply iMac. Yeah, the uh, URL changed too. It's apple.com slash Mac slash iMac, and yeah. it used to be iMac-24. It's not anymore. So, not anymore. I mean, it's just the iMac. That's the whole how problem. how many ways can we tell you that uh, you it's yeah, over. we are never ever getting back together? Yeah. This episode is brought to you by ExpressVPN. Using the internet without ExpressVPN, it's a little bit like if you forget to mute yourself on a Zoom call, and then every single person on every team in your company hears you blasting your favorite episode of Upgrade in the background. So why should everyone consider getting a VPN? Because ISPs can know every single website that you visit. If they want to, your ISP could use this information. They could sell it to people who might use your data uh, to target you with marketing. This is the thing that happens. ExpressVPN reroutes your network data through a secure encrypted tunnel so your ISP can't see or sell your online activity. The best part about it is it's super simple to use. You just fire up the app, click one button, and you're done. Plus, it's rated number one by CNET and TechRadar. Works on all of your devices, phones, laptops, and routers, so everyone who shares your Wi-Fi can be protected too. I can attest to just how easy it is to use ExpressVPN. It sits in the menu bar of my Macintosh, 
And whenever I want, I just hit the little logo and I click the button and I am connected. It's easy for me if I want to reroute my traffic through somewhere else, if I want to be able to access content that's outside of like some geo restrictions that I have. Really easy to do. One of the many reasons why I do it. And if I'm on a Wi-Fi network that I don't trust as well, ExpressVPN gives me that peace of mind. You can protect your online privacy by going to expressvpn.com slash upgrade today. That is expressvpn.com slash upgrade, and you can get an extra three months free. That is expressvpn.com slash upgrade. Our thanks to ExpressVPN for their support of this show and all of Relay FM. It's time for the details. So we're going to spend more time in a future episode actually looking at 17.2 because there's a lot in there. Um, yeah. I've said for weeks now that we were going to do this and things keep happening that's putting things it off. Things keep happening. But yeah, the I, thing those is, live activities, I think. Those indeed. New live activities in standby. I think that's got to be a 17.2 thing. I wasn't getting those before. So there's stuff happening. Things are happening, Mike. And still happening. We can keep pushing it because 17.2 isn't out yet. Right? So like, it's like right. this is the thing we can right. get to when, we, when there's... Other, when there isn't other more important things to talk about. But right. this week, Apple not only dropped in the beta the ability this past week to record spatial videos on the iPhone. So now on the iPhone, you can scroll to one of the many, many, many things you can scroll through now in the camera app. Well, it's it's not a scroll. It's a, oh, it's a it button. Not? You you, you turn you. on. So there's a there's a setting in photos that le- allows you to do in the, in the photo settings of the settings app. Uh, the that camera lets you settings? Um, do advanced it's like where you set all the kind of advanced uh okay. features of like do you want to capture raw and all those things and one of the switches down there is capture 3d video capture spatial video but then and how you do, do you that, actually make the capture uh you're in the video tab and there's a little uh button that okay. is a picture of a vision pro <laughs> and okay. if you tap it and it lights up yellow and then you, you are recording only horizontally right. only 1080 p30 yep and uh, that's how you do it. So it's just a mode of video right. capture. It's not a special spatial that's cool, video actually. thing you swipe to. Because my hope is that in the future, this will work like a live photo works in that like once they've gotten better at this, that like you can just record video, but it will also capture the data or like will also yeah. capture a second well, video or something. That's my hope th- for the future. Th- well, you could always leave this on. You're just going to only get 1080 p30 yeah which and is the not... reason for that is and you can only that... record horizontally <laughs> too and you can only record yeah. horizontally and the reason for that is you got to have two cameras next to each other so that you can do the parallax effect and that means it has to be horizontal and then they moved it so that it's the ultra wide and the wide that are together and that the telephoto is is elsewhere um, and the reason to do that is that they can crop the ultra wide to have it match the wide and you end up with a usable set pair of images that are offset to generate a 3D video. But once you crop the ultra wide to the same field of view as the wide, guess what? You can't do the resolution, the beautiful resolution that you would normally get in the wide. And you're down to, you know, essentially they were not happy with anything other than 10, 1080p 30 so that's where we are for now. I would put money on the fact that Apple is working on their camera stack to make it more capable of shooting 3D video. And I would also not be surprised if in the long run, not only are they focused on having the higher quality mm. on the cameras so that their 3D video is of a higher resolution, but that they make it so that their camera stack works at 90 degrees from each other <laughs> so that they can do uh, vertical as well as horizontal. But this is I the, didn't know this it, in, until I read uh, some of these stories that with the new iPhone, they, they rearranged where the cameras were placed so that this would work. Yeah, yeah, that was they, part they of the the, the, the agenda. Yeah, it feels like this was a nothing's a quick swap, but Mm-mm. it feels like this was this is not a complete rethinking of the iPhone's camera system so far as I can tell as it is we're going to need to do 3D capture on the iPhone and they made it work, but what I'm saying is I would probably put money on um a future camera stack design that is more specifically um, designed to be capable of shooting spatial yeah. video. So they introduced spatial video recording on the iPhone, and then in conjunction with that, Apple brought in a selection of journalists to experience some of these spatial videos recorded on iPhones on a Vision Pro. So yeah. more people got in nice. to go in, try on Vision Pros again. It seemed like quite a select group. 
The response to this overall was once again very positive from everyone about kind of the experience of using the Vision Pro. And I particularly liked this quote from Joanna Stern because uh, Joanna kind of sums up my initial feelings of the demo that we had of seeing these spatial videos. Uh, so Stern says, Apple showed me some other spatial videos. In one, a dad was telling his young kids a story in the back of an RV. It was so lifelike and cozy that it almost creeped me out. Why am I spying on this random family? That's obviously the big appeal here. Spatial videos create intimacy in ways 2D videos and photos don't. So like the technology is really cool, but if it's not your videos, it makes you feel kind of weird because it, it's so good. So uh, I thought that this was interesting as a way of getting like a new renewed focus on the product again. And they're having yeah. these like smaller experiences for people to talk about ahead of kind of, I guess, a re-reveal of the product next year. I thought this was very clever from Apple to kind of like keep throwing the breadcrumbs out there for now. And they didn't get to, you know, they're going to release that capture feature. They did release that capture feature in beta. And so people are going to talk about it. People are going to yeah. reverse engineer the file format. Um, all those things are going to happen. I actually am, am, I haven't looked, but I'm assuming that at some point I'm going to be able to look the stuff that I've captured already. Uh, look at that in, on my, uh, on my quest, right? Cause somebody will reverse engineer yes. it or find a way to play it or something and, and have it be like a 3d, you know, thing in other video players. I, I imagine that will happen. It's just a, 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 a heath package right with two videos in it and when you play it back you only see one of them anyway i did capture some this weekend just thinking um this is gonna you know build up a library now for when yeah. the vision pro comes out uh, the 17.2 betas are also showing indication that 3d movies are finding their way mm -hmm. to the apple tv app with a new icon that shows an outline of a vision pro with the word well the the, the, the character's 3d overlaid on top yes. Mac Rumors are reporting that, quote, 3D titles seen in the Apple TV app include Jurassic World Domination, Pacific Rim Uprising, Shrek, Trolls, Warcraft, Minions, The Rise of Gru, Mortal Engines, Everest, Kung Fu Panda 3, and more. What a ragtag selection of movies. Yeah, well, there. you know, they're, they're, this they're just loading I mean, them in. They're loading them in. People are they're loading them in. That's it. I expect that at launch, I think somebody said that they saw Hugo in there, and that's a, that's a there's really loads. good there's loads, 3D right? movie. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I would imagine since Hollywood generally has 3D versions of most of their movies that they will put them in there because this is an opportunity for them to be seen and the 3D TV market didn't really take off. No. So having 3D titles available in Vision Pro seems like a pretty, uh, like I, absolutely makes sense to me. Makes this is making it all feel like the Vision Pro is in fact very close, right? That like there are now these other bits of the system that need oh. to be put in place. Yeah, so I said something on Mastodon this weekend. I said that I went to at the Cal game this weekend. I captured like I captured uh, which for me is like even from when I was a kid is like the moment which is when you come through the tunnel and out into the stands. Mm. Um, and this field opens up to you and you're in the canyon and the hills are in the background and all of those things. And so I captured that in spatial. Yep. Um, and then I did some like the band and stuff like that. I just did a few. And my whole thought process was capture it now while this is happening. And in the winter, you know, I when there are no football games to capture, I will be able to relive this mm -hmm. moment and see how it makes me feel and all those things. Right. I, just, I like thinking ahead. Yeah. And somebody on Mastodon replied and said, you wish winter. And I said, okay, first off, I don't wish anything. I don't care. It's mm -hmm. not my job to ship the product. And they backed off and said something like, oh, I meant everybody. I'm like, well, that's not what you said. You said you wish. Um, but uh, I am, despite that person, I am actually pretty confident that this is a, a, a winter thing. I, I just, I, I think it's going to come sooner mm -hmm. than people think. I don't have anything to back that up other than that Apple seems to be continuing to say early next year, and my understanding is the hardware's been done a long time, and that they're working real hard on the software. And I would be, I would be surprised if it lingers into like into spring, you know, into the second quarter. I think it'll be earlier than that, maybe the thing a lot that earlier. Surprises than that. me is I have not seen any indication that developer kits have ever been shipped. Yeah, that's true. That's true. I mean, if if there have been there haven't been leaks and nobody's There's, talking, and about I just it. don't believe that there is any way that they could be shipping them to 
individual developers or small companies and at least the existence of that fact would not have gotten out there and i have not seen that or heard that from anyone and so like that's the surprising thing to me just because they made people submit those forms so long ago now right right? like within a couple of weeks after it was announced we know they're bringing retail employees into Cupertino. Yep. I think that's early next year. And they're year doing more to, like uh, the, the developer yeah, labs are training. expanding them across uh, mm-hmm. different uh, territories, which is good. Like they're doing that, right? But yeah, th- that has been the surprising thing to me. I still believe it's on track for early, but I, I'm kind of wondering why they bothered with the developer kit thing. I mean, maybe they shifted directions and they've focused on expanding those developer kitchen sessions instead and maybe the developer um, kits just come out when the product comes out because well that's what realistic. i was thinking is it may yeah. it, it may just get to the point where they're like you know what let's just ship this yep. <laughs> why are we going through this other process i don't know and it's possible that it is delayed i just i don't get those vibes i just don't feel like it's going to be um you know tim cook is still real sounds real confident about it no i still think it's and, coming like in january february like yeah, I feel very like confident. Early, early next year. Yeah. I don't think May is early next year, right? I don't think April is early next year. I think, I it think will it's before be... the spring. Like I'm on your, I'm on I your agree. board here. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Anytime. <laughs> Anytime. Welcome to be. Welcome to the board. Uh huh. You're on the Jason board now. That's great. I'm the uh, chairman, but you can be on it. I'm happy for that. That's no problem with okay. me. Okay. Thank you, Jason. It's a di- it's a diving board though. It, it Bad is... news. Sure. Okay. <laughs> It is Rumor Roundup time. Woo! And yeehaw! We have so much Rumor Roundup yeah. that we There's are going to be breaking Rumor Roundup today into a selection of different products. Okay. Is what we're going to be doing. Many rumors round up. Many yes. rumors to be rounded. I'm okay. going to start today with iPad and Mac. That's where we're going to begin. So, the ELEC has some details about the OLED displays that will power future iPads and Macs. Okay. Apple are going to be working with LG Display to put together an OLED package, which is custom for them, for Apple, to uh, sit in both the 11 and 13-inch iPad Pros on schedule for next year with a right. MacBook for 2027. Just the panels, uh, another report of what we've heard before. Yep. Really? Yep. This is like more confirmation stuff, right? The, this mm-hmm. is the, the interesting part to me. This is new. I, is it? I don't. It's not wall breaking, but the panels that uh, Apple would be using will feature what's called a two stack tandem structure, which features two light emitting layers on the display, so that brightness levels are maintained from the like LCD and micro LED. Is it micro LED that's in the iPad Pro now, or is uh, it mini, mini LED? I mini LED? LED, yeah. 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 Uh, the minute it, so they will retain the brightness levels from OLED because typically OLED is not as bright. I found out from this that the iPhone uses a single stack OLED, so it must this yeah. must be a harder problem with larger displays to keep the brightness think, level up. I think that's right. And the stack, I mean, the LCD panels. Um, what you've got is you've got a screen, and then behind it you've got these individual arrays, these arrays of individual LCDs that are that are coming on. Um, or LEDs that are coming on, not LCDs. Um, LEDs that are behind the LCD panel, and they uh, that's how you get the brightness, is that they, they light up more or less. And the more of them, if you had a one-to-one, you'd basically have OLED, right? Mm-hmm. And that's what micro-LED is sort of supposed to be as a technology. So I don't know what they're doing here, but it sounds like maybe they're doing something like this, where there's an OLED layer, and then below it there is a, another... <laughs> light layer whether it's oled or whether it's some other led um layer to give it that boost this is a big deal because maybe you know i mean the ipad it's important that the ipad be bright um taken outside and taken in all sorts of bright environments is really important uh how many times have i said that big bright beautiful screen about the macbook pro since it came out yep um if they replace that with oled in 25 26 27 whenever it is they can't regress, right? Like no. you can't go back to being like, oh well, it's OLED, but it's much dimmer than it was before. I, I don't think they can do that. I don't and think so people that's would a challenge. The benefit with, of OLED in that case, yeah. Right? And yeah. and OLEDs are dark generally. OLEDs mm-hmm. don't get super bright. One of the reasons I don't have an OLED TV in my living room is that my living room has a giant uh, set of windows and French doors on one side, and OLEDs, modern OLEDs, would probably not be bright enough for me to watch like a football game during the day. 
Right. So that's a challenge for Apple to solve here. One of the things I found interesting from this uh, report is like if this is based on f- facts, right? Not just there's not speculation in this part that it is referencing an 11 and 13 because we had wondered like is this time to get rid of the 11 on the iPad Pro and maybe go bigger, especially right. with something else I'm going to talk about in a minute. So this is the case, the 11 inch iPad Pro sticking around. I do think that an 11 inch OLED iPad Pro would be a very nice product, right? Like that. It's why I was so disappointed that they never. Uh, put the new screen technology, the mini LED, in the 11, right? Because that, that just felt like it would be so good and would give it differentiation to the air. But bef- while right. talking about it, that, let me talk about our next thing. Well, we could talk about differentiation. Me, um, okay. So I, I, I did a quick Google, and it sounds like the dual stack, two stack OLEDs are really two layers of OLED. And that... okay dramatically increases or well, doubles the brightness of an OLED panel by having right. two, two different layers of OLEDs, which is, again, light-emitting diodes. They are light-emitting em- dots, basically. Two layers of them, you get more light, which means that it gets to be brighter. It seems hard work to make work. So yeah. and expensive. Mark Gurman, yes, Mark Gurman and Ming-Chi Kuo are reporting that it is Apple's plan to overhaul the entire iPad line next year. Makes sense, makes sense. Uh, Ming-Chi Kuo gave some schedule details for the products. So Kuo is expecting the iPad Air in Q1, So, and that would update the existing 10.9 model and introduce a 12.9-inch iPad Air. Right. The iPad Pro would come in Q2, and would feature the OLED displays in an 11 and 13 and an M3 chip. The iPad and the iPad mini in the second half of the year, but no details. Mm -hmm. And with that, the ninth gen iPad that features the lightning port would be removed from sale so that every iPad is USB-C. Right. So they may be, depending on what's in the 11th generation iPad, they might, that might be cheaper and they get rid of the 9th and the 10th. More likely the 10th will then yes. kick down the price list and yes. the 11th will be a little bit better and we'll yep. continue to have an old iPad in the mix. But the, just the thing that I find interesting is like 11 and 13 inch iPad Air, 11 and 13 inch iPad Pro. Okay. Maybe, you remember those rumors before that the iPad Pro was going to get incredibly expensive? Yeah. I wonder if this is like this is how they mitigate that. Of like, well, we have a big iPad now. Yes, but it's you an don't iPad have to spend Air. the most. You have to buy the most expensive iPad in order to get a big iPad screen yeah. if you if that's what you want. Yeah, yeah, and it uses. This is something that um, when we were talking about iPad a few weeks ago, I talked about the uh, idea that iPads are made by their accessories, right? Like iPads are devices that have that core and then it's all the accessories that go around it. Mm-hmm. And the reason that you make iPads the same size is not just oh, like, it's so confusing. There's two 12.9s. Well, one of the reasons you do it is that you don't have to make two separate everything for that, right? Oh, this is a new 12.5 inch air. And like, you can't, like Apple can't, I mean, they can, but they don't want to make that many different accessories. So if you do a 12.9 air, guess what it's going to use for a magic keyboard? The existing iPad Pro 12.9 Magic Keyboard. Mm-hmm. So keeping those things in sync is a is important for accessories. This episode is brought to you by ZocDoc. You know that feeling you get when you finally find that thing you've been searching for for hours on the internet, that exact new piece of furniture you were looking for that the, all the great reviews told you all about, and it's available for you and you can get it on next day delivery? So why is it that you can find the most random chair or wardrobe from anywhere in the world in just a couple of days? If you want to see a good doctor, it can take forever to get an appointment. Not to mention, how do you even know if they're actually a good doctor? Thankfully, there's ZocDoc, a place to find and book great doctors who actually have amazing reviews, many with appointments available in just 24 hours. ZocDoc is a free app where you can find amazing doctors and book appointments online. We're talking about booking those appointments with thousands of top-rated, patient-reviewed doctors and specialists available to you. You can filter specifically for the ones who take your insurance, the ones that are located near you, and to treat almost any 
condition that you are searching for. Really good way to drill down to just the right person who can help you. These doctors all have verified reviews from actual real patients, not bots. The average wait time to see a doctor booked on ZocDoc is between just 24 and 48 hours. That's it. You can even get same-day appointments. Once you find the doctor that you want, you book them immediately with just a few taps in the app so no more awkwardly waiting on hold of a receptionist or well, my favorite thing is not having to both wait for like two weeks to get an appointment because it's like maybe i don't need the appointment at that point and then also you can do some you can if you want to do them uh, virtually the appointment so you don't even have to go to the waiting room which i think huge plus so go to ZocDoc.com slash Upgrade FM and download the ZocDoc app for free. Then find a book top-rated doctor today. That is Z-O-C-D-O-C dot com slash Upgrade FM. ZocDoc.com slash Upgrade FM. Our thanks to ZocDoc for their support of this show and all of Relay FM. So we're going to re- continue our rumor roundup, and now we're going to talk about the Apple Watch. Okay. So, Mark Gurman had a really big story that was also, like, history. It's um, a great story. It's, like, really detailed, really interesting. Uh, it's good reporting, but as well as looking backwards, it looks right. forwards. With a little Drake bit. Bennett, we should say, that was a co Thank you. Line. Thank you very much. I missed that, so I appreciate that. Uh, so, this is talking about health in Apple's products, but mostly focused on the Apple Watch because it's the product that they focus on most. So, I'm going to give a quote from the article. Apple has an enticing roadmap for 2024, including hypertension and sleep apnea detection for the watch and hearing aid capabilities for AirPods. There are plans to turn its forthcoming Vision Pro into a health and fitness device and work continues on a paid health coach service that uses AI. So I want to dig into a couple of these things a little bit more. So hypertension detection is enabled via a blood pressure monitoring system that would be found in the 2024 Apple Watch. I'll go back to another quote from the report. The system is designed to just tell a user if their blood pressure is trending upward and to offer a journal for the user to jot down what was happening when hypertension occurred. To avoid potentially giving a misdiagnosis, the feature will then direct a user to talk to their doctor or check their blood pressure with a traditional cuff, which can provide exact systolic Mm. and diastolic measurements. Um, I love this idea that, you know, there's the proverbial, not to make light of this, mm-hmm. um, but the proverbial, like, that really raised my blood pressure moment. Yes. <laughs> and your watch goes, yes, it did. <laughs> and you're like, yeah, okay, really raised my blood pressure. And I say that as somebody with high blood pressure, I will say that. I, I, am, a, I am a person who takes medication for high blood pressure, so I get it. I get it. But it's mm-hmm. still funny to, I mean, it's a little like the noise thing, right? Where I'm at a football game, yep. and it's fourth down and they're going for it and we're all yelling because we're our team's on defense and i get a little thing on my watch that says it's a little bit loud right now i'm like yeah it it, it is it's it's okay watch it's okay <laughs> so now it's like somebody said something that really pissed you off didn't they your blood pressure uh maybe check it yeah so uh i had the other day my first um high heart rate thing you know where it's like your heart oh. rate's a little high i've never had one before uh i was watching the marvels <laughs> you know, ah, in, in, in the cinema and there was a big tense sure. moment i guess because my heart rate shot up i'd been to the uh, gym before so maybe i was like you know a little high a little high anyway but yeah i've never had one of those before that's and it was amazing like, hey your heart rate's too high and i was like oh my god <laughs> captain marvel no you know i was obviously very upset fun movie by the way going to see aside. it tonight it's, I, it, I, I had a great time. See, talk about discourse. There's a lot of discourse out there about, oh, Marvel people are getting tired of Marvel, and I guess it didn't open well, and, and uh, there's some negative reviews of it. And like, Every human being I know who I've talked to has, yep. who has seen it has liked it. So it, I honestly, don't know. to me, felt like a return to form, like yeah. from a movie perspective. I was like, that was, I had a really good time watching that movie, and I cared about what happened, you know? Uh, I will also say, on a side note, Loki season two, fantastic. Same I think, story there. Yeah, I've between heard these a lot of discourse two, about it, and yeah, then I talked to my friends about it, and they're all like, I really enjoyed it. I haven't watched it yet. Between these two, I feel like they're getting their groove back. But This is anyway. a little sub-segment we call the Marvel moment. <laughs> Marvel moment inside of Rumor Roundup. <laughs> inside of Rumor Roundup, there's a Marvel moment. This this very Marvel, too, to actually just uh, everything's alliterated, you know? Of course. Um, in the future, with the hypertension... 
<laughs> they yes. would want to expand it to provide actual exact numbers because what this of would course. do is it says it see that you are trending up, but it's you're not going to be yeah. able to take a blood pressure reading with this initial technology. We talked about this with the temping, and then it turned out that they used the temperature for um, cycle tracking. But yep. it's this idea that you can build sensors that do this stuff on the watch, and it's very impressive when they when they do. But the problem is that like they can't be as exact. They can't be as precise as a purpose built uh, device because they just the 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 shape the place on your wrist all of those things feed into it so instead what you i think you're going to see for a lot of the stuff they add to the apple watch over time is it's going to be like trends without details and saying you should look at this with a purpose built device right if you have high blood pressure you should have a high blood pressure cuff and and you should check that out and what we can tell you is you're trending up which can be really valuable right like if i'm yes. on my medication and i need to go on a different medication cuz it's not doing its job anymore if i was told you know actually your blood pressure is trending up you should you should look into that that is useful but it's not a replacement for the the little thing that is going to go on on your uh, arm and squeeze it or not if you're Johnny Ive or oh, early signs <laughs> for someone who doesn't yeah, yeah. Who has right, not had science. an issue the, before? Yeah, and then your blood pressure is up. That that was a reference, by the way. That apparently, in this story, that Johnny Ive developed like a a squeeze proof um, hypertension like hmm. cuff. Weird. We, okay, but that never came to fruition. Not yet. Yeah, you know? that's right. It's just on the shelf. It's on the Maybe Johnny shelf in the white room. It. They're gonna be like, oh, you can get the Apple blood, yeah, Apple cuff, Apple Here cuff, in case you want it. No, you know what they'll do is they'll be like, yeah, you know. It's uh, Belkin makes a blood pressure. <laughs> oh, of course. It's totally designed by Apple. But, oh, no, no, you can get it from me. <laughs> Look at this. Look at this. It came out at the same time, you know? Am incredible. Um, Amazing. These things, like that idea of being able to give those early warnings, and we're going to talk about some of the stuff like that in a minute too. It is kind of incredible how they are building this product to make it that you would feel like you need to wear it every day, right? right? Because if it's going to be there in the background monitoring your body for signs of an issue that you would otherwise not know about until it's too late or until it's like too far down the path, I mean, who doesn't want to wear that product, right? Like so if, I'm, if I'm like, oh, I have, my blood pressure is fine, I expect at some point in my life it won't be. If I know that sooner based on something that's continually monitoring my body and could then take the path, like the steps to f making a better, like better life choices, like why would you not want to put that on your arm every day when it's also a watch? Like it's not just like this extra thing I have to wear. Like I don't need to get a cuff and take my blood pressure every day, you know? I, um, have seen some this is related i guess to that last thing that i said um some discourse about this story that said because the story points out quite rightly that apple when they talk about health they they face a choice and one of the the choices that they faced is are you focused on well people who may need diagnoses of either they're either they're maintaining their health or they need they're warned that there's a problem or do you focus on taking care of the sick? And so the discourse is like, well, of course Apple doesn't want to take care of sick people. Um, that's th that's all a lie. They just want to have he you know healthy people feel better about themselves. However, again, I'm going to say idealism versus reality here. Um, just pay attention to the history of the Apple Watch, not just from these reports, but like from observing it. It's incredibly difficult. One of the huge reasons that the Apple Watch can't do lots of things is because once you become a medical device, the rules are incredibly specific. And the Apple Watch is meant to be a general use device. When you're sick, you have specific needs and you probably need a specific medical device for it. And they make a lot of medical devices that like connect to the Apple Watch and stuff. But I don't think it's unreasonable for any company like Apple making a product like the Apple Watch to say, look, our goal here is to monitor you and warn you when there's a problem so that you can enter the medical system and get treatment, which might include other 
devices, including maybe devices that work with the Apple Watch. That's that's fine. I've got a blood pressure cuff that does HealthKit. Great. Um, but it, it is... I, I just I don't think it's like some conspiracy. I think it's like realism that that Apple is not, although they put their toe in the water, and, and the story talks about them thinking about doing like healthcare clinics and trying that and realizing how expensive it is and they can't really do it that way. And they're doing something very similar to what Amazon is trying with their healthcare clinics. I think the truth is Apple is a maker of mass market products, and the Apple Watch is a great example of a product that is on the periphery of medical but like is never going to go too far down medical for a few reasons. One of which is because I don't think there's enough space in there to make a de- make it a detailed medical device for all sorts of different conditions in one place. And two, the amount of regulation that would be required would be enormous. And three, you can see here a lot of what they're able to get in that watch shape is not as precise as you'd want for something that is actually actively detailing a medical condition. So, um, I think I think the that explains why the Apple Watch is always going to be I think like this, which is they're going to try their best to do things that will be able to read your wrist and give you a sign, but it's probably never going to be as precise as anybody would want it to be. There will always be a better medical device than the Apple Watch. The Apple Watch is like a leading indicator, a warning light. Uh, it's able to track you because you wear it all the time or can wear it all the time. That's really valuable. But it's not a replacement for a sleep study or a health, a heart monitor that you tape to your chest and wear for a week or like any other medical device. Uh, it, it It's not going to be... Or a, or a proper multi-lead EKG, right? It's never going to be those things. It no. is always going to be like trying to do what it can to give you warnings and information in a limited way on your wrist. So the sleep apnea detection that you mentioned is uh, enabled via, I guess this is just smarts, right? So it's using sleep tracking and breathing patterns. Because like, there right. will be things that they will add over time that don't need sensors, Right. It's just like right. we do we are able to use data and like that's how I imagine that even something like the blood pressure system could get better over time of like if you have enough of them out there and you and can better, build a uh, model. You built a better machine learning model, yeah. right? That's exactly what it is. And the sleep apnea detection, I mean, what are, sleep sleep detection is already using a machine learning model because what yeah. does it have? It doesn't have like a sleep sensor, it's got motion sensors and maybe sound. Uh, I don't know if it's using sound or not to hear snoring or breathing or whatever, but like motion and it, you do, you know, machine learning training on these very minute motions and you are able to pull patterns out of that data and see your breathing patterns and yep. see your sleep patterns at it. But it's, it's, you know, it's limited because all it, all it has is those sensors in the Apple watch. That's it. What continues on the blood glucose monitoring system? I f- when I was reading about this in this report, like, you know, we spoke about it before, this feels like the white whale for them. Mm. <laughs> that like if they yep. can get this working, because it also sounds like it will be like this hypertension system initially where it's about trends, not readings. Yeah. But even yeah. then, if they can get that and if they can get up and down working, right, you're trending up or trending down, my word, it's going to be huge if they can yeah. get this to work well again they're trying to do things like yeah monitor your blood sugar and and it may again it may not be something that's useful for full-on diabetics but it may be useful for people who are pre-diabetic or might not know that they're pre-diabetic to make changes and understand how their blood sugar is affecting but also them. just for people to understand their diet more yeah absolutely right oh why is my blood sugar up i just had a bunch of carbs yeah well, and like everybody reacts go. differently to different types of foods, right? So like exactly. it may help you better plan what you're eating and when you're eating it based on you being right. able to see when your blood pressure is going up and down. Uh, sorry, when your blood glucose is going up and down. Yeah. And uh, but and again, this is I just this is one of those cases where I think that there was some initial uh, idealism inside Apple when the Apple Watch was being developed that they were going to be like a medical device that just could tell everything. And they've had, in the last 10 years, a lot of reality about what is capable, even with the amazing things that they're able to pack in that watch, what they're really capable of doing when all they have is a little tiny window onto a person's wrist. There are incredible limitations to that. Um, and and that's just 
that's that's just how it's going to be. So in this case, you know, like, are we going to be able to be a full on blood glucose monitor? Like, and it's like, well, maybe not. But we're gonna. There's value in what we can do. I think is what they're trying to do. There's a lot of that with the Apple Watch now. I can't imagine any computer based system that could be sticking the little thread inside of your arm, right? Like that's like, I mean it's in maybe there. that would be quite a breakthrough, but it's always gonna be like, you know, you're you're looking through skin and a blood vessel exterior to make some judgments about what's going on in the blood, and then there's looking at the blood. Mm-hmm. And those are you know, one of them is harder. But again, I'm I'm not I think that there will be sensor and machine learning breakthroughs that will yes. be amazing, right? Yeah. But there probably not saying but like there's also a good chance that there are things that you literally can't measure no matter how intelligent you are yeah from sitting on the back of someone's wrist but i mean right? even with like the models and that kind of stuff you're still just going to go and have somebody check your real like, check the blood right like you, you'll get to a point you'll be like this doesn't seem right or something's going wrong here you would go to the doctor and you you'd have a blood test done or something right like yeah there's i think there's something there um, and also to to round out this to, to you know because basically I read the quote with touching all the things the AirPods mm-hmm. thing would is so AirPods would essentially get the functionality to work as a replacement for an over the counter hearing aid so they'll build in the functionality to make it like it could work like a hearing aid as yeah. well as being able to use AirPods to perform hearing tests. So we talked about this a while ago, the idea that they've changed the way that hearing aids are licensed in the U.S. And right. it should, the, the, at the time, it was sort of like this should open the door for companies like Apple to be able to make things like AirPods work as hearing aids instead of having to sort of like not do certain things or not make claims or have to sell them as a medical device. Like they, they can do this. And this was an interesting report because it suggests that that is happening. I hadn't heard before that it was definitely happening within Apple, just that it opened the door for Apple to go in there. And any of us who've used like AirPods and AirPods Pro and all the different processing, like it's, it's hard not to think about how it could probably have different modes that would be more like a traditional hearing aid. So here we are. And and also I'll point out, there are a lot of people who um, resist hearing aids and there are people who can't afford them. That's an issue. Um, but there are also people who resist them and don't think they need them. And even though they don't, they totally need them. Yeah. <laughs> they don't think they need them. I've had some relatives like that. This is really interesting, I think, for those edge cases where it's somebody who doesn't think they need a hearing boost, like, oh, I don't need a hearing aid. But then they say, oh, but Apple's got this thing that makes conversations clearer. And you're like, oh, that sounds like a good idea. Don't tell them it's a hearing aid. It's just making conversations clearer, right? Like, that's right. that's great. That's awesome. Uh, on a separate note, Ming-Chi Kuo is reporting that there are currently no signs that an Apple Watch Ultra 3 is in development. Quo believes that the likelihood of a new version in 2024 is decreasing and feels that this may be because of production issues with the micro LED display that Apple wants to bring to the product within the next couple of years. This is whatever, right? This report, I feel like. The reason I wanted to bring it in is because the question I wanted to ask you is, I wonder if it's all focus on this Apple Watch X instead and so they're Could like, be. here's one watch next year, and it's like the brand new watch. I don't know. Or, or this is nothing. Or they're taking a year off, and yeah. there'll be a minor increment to the Apple Watch in 24, and then the big watch updates will happen simultaneously in 25. I, yeah. I think they're... Look, it's great that the Apple Watch Ultra 2 came into being. You've got one, right? And it's I great. love it. That If you want my long-term review, I adore it. Yeah, I, I don't feel like the Apple Watch Ultra needs to be updated every year. It's nice if it is, but it, I don't feel like it needs to be. And if they skip a year with it, like Ultra 2 is going to be fine. Mm-hmm. It's going to be fine. And um, and I don't think it says anything about the future of the Apple Watch Ultra. I'm actually pretty convinced that the Apple Watch Ultra is a winner and it's going to stick around. But yeah, it's possible that this is also like they're, they're, um, they're saving up and, uh, you know, 2025 might be the big Apple Watch year. Who knows? This episode is brought to you by Factor. This holiday season, you might be looking for nutritious, convenient meals to keep you energized on jam-packed, busy days. Factor is America's number one ready-to-eat meal delivery service. 
can help you fuel up fast for breakfast, lunch, and dinner with chef prepared, dietitian approved, ready to eat meals that are delivered straight to your door. You're going to be saving time, eating well, and staying on track with your healthy lifestyle while tackling all of your holiday to do lists. With Factor, you can skip the stress of meal prepping over this busy season. Their fresh, never-frozen meals are ready in just two minutes, and you have more than 35 flavor-packed options to choose from every week. Like what, Jason? What are these flavor-packed options? Are they good? Do you enjoy them? It's been a little while since I got one, but yeah, it was uh, the chicken. I had a bunch of chicken stuff, um, which was great. There were some veggie ones, too. And the thing that I always say about these is um, it's just the quality of the ingredients. The veggies were good. The chicken was good. I have definitely had, you know, and I, I microwave them too. And it's like, you know, you put meat in the microwave and you're like, oh. and it was just, it was great. Like the whole thing, they tasted great. The quality was great. I think you get bad stuff and you heat it up and, it, and it, you know, maybe it was frozen or maybe it was, you know, wherever it came from, it can be uh, really questionable. And uh, the factor stuff, that's what I walked away from. And even now, like a month or two later, like just uh, high quality stuff of a kind that I don't, I'm not super accustomed to getting in a pre-made box meal. And if you want some special occasion meals during the holidays, you can level up and get the Gourmet Plus options prepared to perfection by chefs and ready to eat in record time. You can en- you can keep your energy up with lunch to go. Factors effortless, wholesome meals like grain bowls and salad toppers, no microwave required. Then to finish your order, choose from more than 45 add-ons, including breakfast items like apple cinnamon pancakes, bacon and cheddar egg bites, and smoothies. You can rest assured that you're making a sustainable choice because Factor of offset 100% of their delivery emissions to your door and source 100% renewable electricity for their production sites and offices. This November, get Factor and enjoy eating well without the hassle. Simply choose your meals and enjoy fresh, flavor-packed meals delivered directly to your door. Ready in just two minutes, no prep, no mess. Head to factormeals.com slash upgrade50 and use the code upgrade50 and you will get 50% off your first box. That is the code upgrade50, upgrade50 at factormeals.com slash upgrade50 for 50% off your first box. A thanks to Factor for their support of this show and Relay FM. The final rumor roundup for today is about iOS. Some stuff going on right. in iOS. So first up, we go back to the sheriff, Mark Gurman, who has been report had a couple of reports over the last couple of weeks about the development of iOS 18 and macOS as well, of course, but obviously most of this stuff is focused around iOS these days, uh, and kind of what Apple's doing and a little bit of what they're focusing on. So last week, in his Power On newsletter, Mark detailed that Craig Federighi ordered a freeze on all new development to focus on bugs and issues in the current internal builds of iOS 18. So they were unhappy at Apple with the quality, I think, of what was being produced, and it was really buggy, which is funny that they're like, how buggy could it be this early? You know what I mean? Like, if it's right. bad, right? Like, you'd expect it to be buggy. It must have been pretty bad <laughs> for them, right? Yeah. <laughs> to, to do and that. I, and then there was that, um, in his newsletter, he mentioned that these, they're usually four milestones. I didn't know any of this, right? We don't get to yeah. see much inside the, be- no. the black box at Apple. Um, nice to know that also in this report, it's very clear, like, these are described as being changes that Craig Federighi has made to try to address issues. And I like hearing about, Since like, 2019, that he's been working because he's in charge of software, right? He's been working to try to address some issues that we've all seen on the outside internally. And that's great. Um, so Mark said in his newsletter, like there's these four milestones and that they tend to be sort of like development and then sort of like fixing their regressions and integration. And then, and they kind of alternate. And it sounds like this was one of those where it's like, wait, 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 <laughs> we can't move on to the next milestone. It's not good enough. Yep. So let's spend another week on this milestone addressing all the issues and so it's not like a big like press the stop button and and cease and all of that it's more the, the way it came across to me is it's more like he wasn't satisfied with it going to the next stage it didn't feel like they were ready to go there and like i am never gonna say no no move on don't fix the bugs right like so many apple's platforms are so mature right now 
and they need and we all rely on them and they need to be stable <laughs> and they need to work well and they need to not be full of bugs. There was a part in this report that I really liked. It says, in 2019, Federighi adopted a policy that his division calls the pact. And the Mm -hmm. pact is, we will never knowingly allow regressions in the build. And when we find them, we will fix them quickly. Yeah. I like that. I like it. Just a fun thing. So, uh, Mark Gurman saying that iOS 18... This is int- this is this seemed weird to me. iOS 18 is going to be used to sell the iPhone 16 because the iPhone 16 is not going to have a lot of changes, and so they yeah. want iOS 18 to be really good. And I kind of, I don't know what I think about that. Like, what is it just going to be like a bunch of iOS 18 features that are only in the iPhone 16? I I also don't know if yeah I mean maybe I also don't know how much of this linkage is real and how much of it is Mark Gurman's analysis based on his knowledge of the iPhone yep. 16 not being particularly anything I I'm not sure if somebody said oh they they want this to be good because there's nothing in the iPhone 16 or if he sees they want this to be good and he looks at the iPhone 16 and doesn't think that there's anything in it and makes a connection. I I don't know that, but that does seem weird. And it does, I mean, lends credence to some of our vibes sometimes where it's like, why is this feature only on this model when it could have been on a previous model? Yeah. And, you know, although, I, I mean, it doesn't have to be that, right? Like it could be, and I'm sure it is every cycle that there is new hardware in the 16 that they know about that they're building features for. And that, you know, well, but but it is an interesting note of like, we really got to sell this um, because I guess, does, does Apple feel like one of the biggest selling points of iPhone hardware is the new OS that you can get on your old hardware? I don't know. I don't know. Well, apparently iOS 18 is being positioned with a focus on AI and machine learning, quote, Internally, That's Apple senior management has described its upcoming systems as ambitious and compelling with major new features and designs in addition to security and performance updates. So iOS 18 feels like a big one. There's no real detail on it. But like, if it's yeah. meant to be a focus on AI, is it like that the chip is needed, right? That like they need more machine learning well, I, cor- I, like I, cores? I can't imagine that they're going to make an ambitious and compelling update that only Just has features on for the iPhone yeah. 16. So this I is why I think that, that I don't, I'm not convinced that these two are linked as such. Um, but I like the idea that, that this is the um, machine learning and AI release because it does give us all hope that that means they're going to do some things uh of an intelligent assistant variety, which I think would be uh, would be great, right? Like we, it's Siri, gotta be Siri, right? It's gotta be needs Siri. Needs to be replaced throughout, right? Yeah. And there was, it was just one other quote that I wanted to read because I just it made me feel bad for Apple engineers for like how confusing their life must be. So, last month the company completed the first internal versions of the updates, including the biggest new features. When Apple gets to that stage known as M1, it usually embarks on work for the next milestone, M2. In this case, the debugging break delayed the start of M2 development by a week. So inside of Apple, they have things called M1 and M2, and I guess M3 yeah. and M4, and that just make, sure. must make their lives so complicated sometimes now because yeah. well, the M2. These chips. are the M1 Max. Max. <laughs> and they're in M2 Max? stage. <laughs> M2, M1, Max, Max. Yeah, it makes that makes perfect <laughs> Perfect sense. The the going back to the ML thing, like yeah. last week there was that um that AI pin event. Oh, the uh, humane. Thing. Yeah, humane. Yeah, which was not a not a good marketing video. I would say everybody should watch that video as a good example of how good Apple is at marketing videos because I think they did a bad job. Um, I think the presentation wasn't very good. It has mistakes in it, but it's more than that. They also like I think they mis- misprioritized the way they describe the product and like. One of the first things they talk about is like the colorways of the product. I'm like, nobody cares, dude. That's at the end. Like, it, why are you saying that first and using those terms in that way and it, having your cutie names for colors that are just white and black and silver, whatever. Um, but what I, so that's my nutshell of the humane thing is like, it, it, I don't think it was, I think the product was let down by the presentation. I think the product is a weird um, and probably should be part of a larger ecosystem of products, but they got funding to ship a product. So it's a standalone product with its own phone number. Like, all right, whatever. I will say but, on this this pin, like I watched the video 
And the yeah. whole time I was like, if Apple made this, I would buy this. Yeah, well, th this is the thing is, as part of a constellation of devices, having a device that is, um, I mean, a lot of it you don't need if you've got an iPhone or AirPods and all that, but like mm -hmm. they do also have the thing where it's like a, an Apple Watch, but they also have the, a, a camera looking out, which has value and, and Apple's ecosystem sort of doesn't have something like that can, that can see around you. But really what I took away from it and the thing that I really wish Apple had and that other platforms have as well is they are basically saying, look, our entire interface is basically a GPT AI. Like that is the whole interface. And we don't even do apps. You just tell it what you want and we get what it is back. I think there's a fundamental mistake that they're making that I understand because, they, again, they had to make a product and this is the product. But like... Their attitude is that people don't like their smartphones, which is bananas because people love their smartphones. Like, oh, smartphones, who has time for them? Like, well, everybody in the human race seems to have time for smartphones, friends. But, oh my goodness, the, atti the attitude they have toward machine learning, AI, chat, talk, information source, that's what I took away and said, I want it, right? Like, I want. that's what it's supposed to be like. Alexa isn't like that. Google Assistant isn't like that. No. Siri is certainly not like that. Like, th but that's the dream. And yeah, it hallucinated. It got a bunch of stuff wrong. It got the eclipse location wrong, and they kept it in the video, which is like, what are you doing? Um, but the potential of being able to say, you know, what do I know about this? And it's looked at your, you know, think about it from an Apple perspective. It's got your notes. It's got your contacts. It's got your email. It knows everything about you. It is a personal assistant that you can use to find things that you have in your personal data cloud, but that you don't have in your brain. It doesn't make the connection in your brain. And it can make that connection. That is huge. The potential there is enormous mm -hmm. to make our devices better. I don't think it makes the smartphone obsolete, which is sort of what Humane's trying to say here. But when we're talking about Apple trying to focus more on, on machine learning and AI stuff, and I know everybody is trying to do this right now. Like, that's what I want. I want these assistants to be so much better. One of the benefits of Apple having this enormous ecosystem that they've built is that their machine learning technologies could consume the content in the ecosystem, in your personal ecosystem, and know it. And that would be incredibly valuable if you could act on that. Um, so I don't know how realistic those humane demos even are, and there were a lot of mistakes in them, but like, it showed the potential of something like a Siri 2 to do this if it works right. Yeah. And that's the big question is, is this something that happens this year or in five years before it's good enough? And Apple's limitations and its conservatism about like, well, you know, if Apple's got a thing that tells you the eclipse is in Australia when it's in America, guess what? They're not, not only they're not going to put that in their demo, they're not going to ship it because they don't want to be embarrassed. So there's a lot of challenges going on I just can't believe they didn't check here. the video. I can't. Is this happened in every AI focused product video? Yeah. Like, it feels like the obvious Fact thing checker. to do. Fact like, checker. Check it. Fact checker. And also, why yeah. would you ask questions in a product video that you know it can't give the that you don't know it can give correct answers to? I know. Like, Nev never ask a question you don't know the answer to in a in a marketing video. That is that is very sure. strange. Very strange. Anyway, but the potential is enormous. I like again. Yeah. Um, I. I I don't know if a pin is the right way to go. It does make me feel like that, you know, eventually having something you wear, maybe maybe glasses, even if all there is on them are some sensors, yep. um, as a part of the kind of broader picture. Like realistically, any product like this that's going to succeed needs to have a camera on it, and so and that camera needs to be able to see what you can see. Like so, it's either physical, like a pin, or it's glasses, right? Like the Ray Bans, like. Because yeah. it, it seems like if you're able to look at something, be like, what is that? Like, who does? You know, that's just like that's cool. Like, you right, know, like, your it's phone, just like, yeah, your your phone's in your pocket, so your yep. phone's not not looking around and having. And I, I somebody on Mastodon was like, oh yeah, that's going to be really good video, right? Like it's all, and it's like, well, that's not the point. First off, you are totally underestimating how good stabilization is these days, um, uh, based on machine learning. You take a wide field, and even though it's jumpy you can stabilize that thing. And it's so valuable for it to see what's around you. It can already hear what's around you with your Apple Watch or your headphones or whatever, um, but it's an extra layer and it's a 
piece of sensory information that the iPhone doesn't have if it's in your pocket. Yeah. So that part is cool. The rest of it I could take or leave because I have an Apple Watch and it's got a speaker on it. And I, I, some of their demos where it's like, oh, you can play music to yourself on a thing that's hanging Pasonic, on your pocket. I'm like, Sonic speaker. Uh, yeah, I, I did like the um, the fact that it required physical interaction to invoke things. Sure. Because that is like, there needs to be visuals to the world, right? That like you're doing something. Like I think right. that's going to be really I, important. But I do that all the time by pressing the digital crown on my watch. I don't do a lot of hey yeah. activations. Yeah. I do a lot of press the crown and say something because mm-hmm. I don't like those mistaken activations. I like being able to make a physical thing. But I feel like like if you're looking at everything that the humane AI pen is purportedly doing, there are most of them are covered by a product in Apple's product constellation. But some are not. And that that I find that interesting. And then there's the whole machine learning thing, which is like, again, if you buy into the premise, and I, I think this is the beauty of, of these ML models, is like where their secret sauce is, well, first off, being able to search the internet and get good answers to you I, that are correct is a good one, right? But like so much of it, I was talking to Dan Morin about this last week on the, I think on the Six Colors podcast. Like he's written, what is it, five novels in the same universe now? Mm. And when he's writing those books, he doesn't remember every word that he's written. He's got like a wiki that he built that I think he's got in, in Obsidian now. But he was saying, you know, the the dream here, and I think he could do that with with GPT now. The dream yeah, the is GPTs. to upload the contents of his yeah. novels and then say things like, what's, what's the color of this character's eyes? And for it to know they're blue or I don't know it, you've never said that. Or he, he, example he gave is, when's the last time this character um, fired a gun? And that's Dan doesn't cool. know the answer, that's right? Cool. And how do you find that even yeah. in a wiki? The, and how do you search for it in manuscripts? You you can't find it. But the the model... Could may know. be able to know the answer to that. That's the potential of all this, is looking through all of your Apple Notes notes and all your reminders and all your calendar items and all your contacts and all your email and all your documents that are in files and or are in a, an API that is connected, and it knows everything. And, you know, it's in your, it's your life, but you may not know the answer, but it knows the answer. That is the, po- that's the promise here, right? That is amazing yep. if, if you could get there. It's like, on the GPTs thing, like I saw on Mastodon last night, Matt Birchler built one of those GPTs for writing alt text for images. Just like, oh, that's really smart. Oh, wow. So you just I saw in, somebody, in the, in the um, app, you just upload an image and it just describes it in a way in which the language is good for alt text. Uh, I just thought it was Dr. super cool. Dr. Wave did a thing where he uploaded all the books about the programming language Lisp. And made a GPT that he can consult about how to program, about pro- programming problems in Lisp. That's cool. Right? Imagine that, right? You're just like, I just put all the books in there. And then all I do is ask, hey, how do I do this? And it knows because it's read all the books. And yes, I mean, there are limitations. It's not going to be creative. It's going to be derivative. But the idea is you bought all the books, you own all the books. Maybe you've even read or looked through all the books. But like your puny human brain doesn't know. And you could look at the indexes and you've got, but you've got eight books and are they well indexed? And how do you find the problem? Or if you've got them, you could do a search, but then you're searching for terms in PDFs. Like there's just a lot of, of these very specific things. Like again, for Dan, it's literally just read, you've read my novels and made all the connections. You tell me the answer. That's so powerful. That's amazing. I would do that for six colors, honestly. That might be a thing I do is give it an entire, give a GPT, the six colors archive, because then I'll know like, when did I write about this? Or or six colors, f- stuff that I've written and upgrade podcast transcripts and stuff. And, and so then I can say like, when did I talk about this and get an answer that's a lot clearer? That would Apparently be awesome. Apparently the, the Discord is letting you know maybe you need a GPT of your own. Leo Laporte did that. Oh, Dr. that was Wave. not Dr. Wave. It was Leo Laporte, you're right. Yeah. Lisp. I See, think if you had a GPT, of, Jason, you could have said who yes, made it that. Would, it would know that it was it was Leo and not uh, Dr. Wave. You're the, right. It's this, mast- this it was late. It was Mastodon. I don't know what I was doing. Is super interesting to me, right? Yeah. Like this idea of what I like about the some of these models is taking your information and 
giving it to something and then you can search your information. And so like the idea of me saying, here is the RSS feed for upgrade. Go and get all of it. Like an event eventually. Mm-hmm. Right? Here's every episode. Put it through Whisper, put the text into the system, and then I can say, I could just ask it questions about things that we've spoken about on the show. Like that is that's right. awesome. Right. That is very right. powerful. Oh, that would that would let us also do like has the Snell Talk question been used before? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes. I no, it's this is this is the thing and that's that's the okay, we're I know we're belaboring it a little bit, but like that's the magic here is like it's not the value is if you if all the information is out there, right? But our our tools to search for it now are so limited. And because you can't keep it all in your brain. You can't. So you have it. You have the AI do it, and it's what they're good at, right? I mean, all this talk about AI is taking over the world and things like that. I mean, there are interesting questions about what happens to a lot of human labor and all that. But the brilliant thing about them is they can do things that our brains can't do. And is that not fundamentally what computers are all about? Is mm-hmm. doing things that are hard for us to do but easy for them to do? That's why we use them. That's why we use computers. Going back to the rumor roundup. All right. Thank you. Sorry. No, I, I was really happy we spoke about that. We had another sidebar. What? Which of that? That was like the. That was like the AI. Uh, atrium. Sure. Well, we can AI that alcove. One. Well, we have to. Well, we, we'll it's got to be that. again. All of our little sidebars have to be um, alliterative now. Sure. So the AI alcove. No, I know, but. All right, we'll work that out. Uh, Mark next? Gurman is also reporting that in the first half of 2024. Apple will have a way to comply with EU laws on sideloading of apps. Mm. It will be a, quote, highly controlled system, and there will also be changes made to both messages and payments apps as a way to comply with further regulation from the European yeah. Union. There's been some code spelunking going on. It looks like what they're doing is that they are putting, and this is the things that German reported earlier this year about how Apple was building things into iOS that would allow them to comply with those EU laws. It sounds like it's very specific, like in a specific region like the EU, and there will be certain APIs that will feed into the system where certain apps will be uh, granted privileges to do things like install apps, Um and so we don't know all the details, but it looks like they are building a system that they can turn on in places where they have to turn it on that will allow. Um, it's unclear to me whether it's pure side loading or if they will allow very specific apps to be put in the app store that can be their own app stores. <laughs> I'm unclear on that part of it, right? Like it sounds like it might be that their approach is in the EU, you can apply to Apple to be an app store. And then you need to follow these things, the you know whatever the rules are, and then you can be an app store in in the EU only, and then your app has the privilege of installing other apps in the system, uh, versus it just being kind of open the doors to sideloading. Unclear exactly what all is going on here, but with this report, I I am more confident that you know they're going to open they're going to open apps to come in by a means that is not the app store. And it's going to be locked to the EU until other places make this demand, in which I case they'll have to put it in all those don't other places. Understand why you would go through the work to make things more complicated when you could just open it up everywhere? Well, because Apple I know, doesn't I want know. to do it. I understand. I, yeah, they I, want their money well, and, at the and, end of the day. And I'm a real Pandora's box believer too that. Um, once this is in the system, you know, people are going to subvert it. People are going to figure out a ways around it. Um, and, and also it's what we were talking about when we were talking about different encryption regulations too. Once this works in the EU, it will be a model and other locations will pass the same ruling because Apple will no longer be able to say, oh no, we can't do it because they did it. And then on top of that, the real test and this, I don't know what's going to happen, although I think it's going to be fine is my guess. Apple has also said sideloading is dangerous and it will destroy everybody's lives and it's bad and you can't do it. Well, we'll see, right? I mean, we'll see. In the EU, it'll be a grand experiment. And if they're, and I'm sure Apple, let me tell you, I'm sure Apple will make hay with any bad ex- examples that happen in the EU of sideloading leading to bad outcomes. But it may be 
that there aren't that many, you know, and it's pretty lean and they can't really, at which point their stance on side loading will be exposed. So it'll be interesting to watch, but it won't be the end of the story. It's just going to, I think, continue from here. Well, it's going to be a mess, but you know what, though? It'll be, it'll be a great episode when it happens, and we can talk about Oh, that's going to be real interesting. It's going to yeah. be great. Yeah, fun. should we do an episode from in the EU? <laughs> <laughs> Guess we might have Go to. Go over there? The Amsterdam episode or something? I don't know. Or maybe, is there an EU? I could go to like a Caribbean island that is like part of the Netherlands and I could probably, that would probably count. I, probably I don't know if that EU counts. I think you so. know what or I, I wonder French, though? Like French Guiana is France. So I could totally sure. go to French Guiana. Okay. If I could get there. The thing that I'm interested in understanding is if they're going to try and do that thing again where they're like, we're going to make you submit your account into us so we can get our 30%. Yeah, right. If, as long as it's not outlawed. Yeah, it's entirely possible. And again, I, I brought up the App Store thing because that's an interesting angle, right? Which is like, well, look, they said we need to do this in the law, but it doesn't mean that we can't regulate app stores, huh? And then here are all the rules if you want to run an app store in the EU mm-hmm. uh, in order to submit your app, right? I, I <laughs> they, will, they will not do anything that isn't required by the law. They will make it as unpleasant and just like with those... Dutch dating apps. They will yep. make it as unpleasant as possible. Jambo Hub in the live chat says, Mike and Jason go to Oktoberfest. <laughs> we just missed it, but we could do it next time. Maybe we'll we go see, see Tim. Eddie and Tim there. There you go. Two of us. We can do our own tour of EU. I love it. Oh, that would be, wouldn't that be different something? Different app in every different country. We'll do a Kickstarter. Easy. Oh. This episode is brought to you by Oracle. AI might be the most important new computer technology ever. It's storming every industry and literally billions of dollars are being invested. So buckle up. The problem is that AI needs a lot of speed and processing power. So how do you compete without costs spiraling out of control? It's time to upgrade to the next generation of the cloud. Oracle Cloud Infrastructure, or OCI. OCI is a single platform for your infrastructure, database, application development, and AI needs. OCI has four to eight times the bandwidth of other clouds, offers one consistent price instead of variable regional pricing, regional pricing, and, of course, nobody does data better than Oracle. So now you can train your AI models at twice the speed and less than half the cost of other clouds. If you want to do more and spend less like Uber, 8x8, and Databricks Mosaic, take a free test drive of OCI at oracle.com slash upgrade. That is O-R-A-C-L-E dot com slash upgrade. One last time, oracle.com slash upgrade. A thanks to Oracle for their support of this show and Relay FM. Let's finish out with some Ask Upgrade questions. First one comes from Sasha, who says, I like the style of the charts that Jason makes on six colors oh. for the earnings reports. How do you make them? Numbers. Is that like, numbers a, like makes... a numbers template, though? No. Numbers okay. makes pretty charts. That's why I use numbers. They make the prettiest charts. And so I have a giant numbers spreadsheet with multiple tabs, and I've got a charts tab in it. And um, I built those to use the colors in the six colors logo, and each of them represents a particular category, except for the money. I just made that dark green because money, 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 um, money, money, money. <laughs> George Arts. So that's it. And and I I have now built up some automations around there. So I've got a, I've got a, I now have a script that has worked for the last few quarters, which is great. I have a script that actually looks at the PDF that Apple puts up of their results and pulls the right numbers out of it and puts it on the clipboard and I just paste it into the number spreadsheet. That's awesome. Because I don't have to retype those and risk getting them wrong. That's happened. I typed it in wrong and had to go back and change all my charts later. Like it just it just does it. That part's great. And then I have another script that outputs them. And the way that works is um, it generates a PDF. And I have this for a shortcut for iOS as well, but mostly I do it at the Mac. As a, it generates a PDF out of numbers, and it goes to the page that the charts are on. Um, and the beauty thing about the PDF is that it's resolution independent. And so it looks at the that page of the PDF and carves it up into, or I think it converts it into an image and then carves it up into little individual images for each of the charts. And 
Um, and so they're all the exact right size and they're saved as pings and they're uploaded to the script, uploads them to six colors and takes the HTML of all of them and puts it on my clipboard so that I can put it in my story. Um, it is, so I've, I've saved myself a lot of time there, which is really nice. Um, the one thing that bugs me about it is that images on the web of charts are not accessible. And I don't like that. But the problem is the uh, putting that kind of stuff on the web in an, in an embed or something that is a little more dynamic, those are bad and they don't work. They just don't work really well. And so I don't love that the charts aren't accessible, um, but I have I have not seen any web technology that would make me want to change how I do the charts into something that would be maybe more dynamically generated and accessible. Um, so I'm always keeping my eye out for that. But uh, for now, anyway, I'm just sort of like willing to go with the fact that I've got a bunch of images and they are they are what they are. Is it? Uh, do you find it to be a lot of work? Like, are you at least happy with the the process you've got down? It's a lot less work than it used to be. I mean, it used sure. to be, and I did this back at MacWorld too. In fact, when I went when I started at Six Colors, I had to make a new template <laughs> right, with with new charts because those were the MacWorld style charts, and I did I I built new charts for the new site, um, and that took a lot of time, and it's taken a lot of tweaking, and you know, changed the fonts and changed the colors and changed the, like it did did a lot of things over the course of the last nine years in terms of tweaking them to be more of what I like and got feedback from people about like the right ways to do it. Talk, I go, to, I go to Dr. Drang a lot. My, uh, my, uh, day and Karen Healy. I've talked to both of them about like the right ways to present data on the internet. Right. Um, cause you know, people who are good at this, uh, you talk to them about this stuff. Um, it's pretty well a well-oiled machine now. I actually add, added a chart after the earnings um, this time for for next time. There was a chart that I wasn't doing that I wanted to add, so I'm going to have to make some tweaks to my export. Um, but I, I'm pretty happy with with how it is now because it's so automated because I don't have to mm -hmm. type those numbers in anymore because I don't have to. I used to have to take screenshots. I had to get the exact right zoom for the window and then go through and take screenshots of every single chart. Huh. That was terrible. I don't have to do any of that stuff anymore. So it's a lot easier now. Mark asks, given the status quo of pre-recorded Apple events, do you think they have dedicated filming studios at Apple Park? I I don't it know. I don't seem think like so. It, right? At least I don't think so. some of the places are just like the outside. Right. There are a lot of things that are just the outside or Steve Jobs Theater. I, I think that they I think that it's probably um, stuff that they've got. The other reason that I think that they probably don't have dedicated studios for for shooting is um, I mean, podcasts are not as important as marketing videos. But what we've discovered with our podcast studio and, you know, we, we say we're recording live sometimes from the, the podcast studio at Apple. I will I will reveal if you didn't already know, dear listener. Every time, I think every time we've done that, it's been a different place. Maybe one of them yeah. repeated, they and all of them were like, place. all of them were existing things converted into yeah. being a podcast studio for the event. So they reuse, I think, some of the equipment and furniture and stuff, but then they just go back into storage. They're not keeping that stuff standing. It gets turned back into whatever it was. So I think, I think no, I think no to that. I, I think it's a lot less uh, dedicated than you would think. Um, and uh, we think of Apple as monolithic, but I also think that they, you know, they use a lot of freelance. I don't think they use a lot of like, I don't, I don't think they keep a marketing video production team on standby 24 seven, right? Like, I don't think that happens. I think they work with production companies. I think they've got some level of in-house, but when it comes time for the big event, they're hiring somebody to do a lot of that work, I think. I was thinking about this when I, when I saw this question come in. I just assume how incredibly disruptive it must be when they're filming. Yeah. Because you never see people in the background. So like, what, do they just say right. like, no one Nobody can go come over to the office today. today or no one can be yeah. in this section of the building today or something like that? And also yeah. the days preceding it where they need to like prettify the environment. Yeah. I do think it's probably weekends. David Schaub in the chat suggested that. I think that there may be some well, there may be some CGI involved. Working at Apple seven days a week? 
Well, yeah, but there's fewer of them. And then I know, I think but I'm th- just it's saying. It's easier like, to say, stay away. Mm. And then I think there's VFX. I think there's probably VFX to keep people out, to make it seem pristine. Yep. Um, and they do often use places that are like the Steve Jobs Theater, right? That's not being used. So that's a, that's an area where they can use it. Um, that home set, that might be a set somewhere. But I don't think it's a set at Apple Park. I think it's a set somewhere that they built and maybe that they keep standing or maybe they folded it and they can bring I mean, it back from time they to time. They literally own sound stages, so Yeah. So there are there are other possibilities there, but uh but yeah, it's probably very disruptive, especially if they're in I don't know where that space is that they call the chip lab, but it feels to me like it's an actual working space. It might not be the chip lab. It might not be the center of the chip lab, right? But I think it's probably a real workspace. I've heard that, that it's real, but I don't know if I believe that. Like I, yeah, I do, I think, but I think I'm not might, like convinced. Well, and like I said, it, it may be in the in the area that the chip team uses, but it's a, a an area that they know is photogenic, and they it gets used in these things, and so yeah. it's not it's not like where the real work necessarily gets done or the core work gets done. But um, but I do think that they yeah they, then they set up in there for a week, and you just have to not be around or, you know, be on the sides and not in the main space. Like, I think that they do that. I think it's probably disruptive. If you are uh, somebody who works at Apple Park and has been disrupted or seen the disruptions of shooting these things, uh, let us know, upgradefeedback.com. You can submit anonymously. There was, there yeah. was, it was go- that was going in a direction that I enjoyed. It sounded like you were about to give some kind of, like, legal thing, you know? Like, if you have been yeah. disrupted at Apple Park, we that's can right. make a claim on your behalf. Call oh, Snell right. and Hurley, you know, and, and we'll take uh-huh. care of it. That's right. Not attorneys and not law. Last week, Adam, Adam wrote in, says, Last week you discussed the trend away from all-in-ones towards standalone monitors and computers. But it got me thinking. Do you think that the inclusion of the A-series chips in the studio display and the fact that it is running an operating system will prematurely limit the lifespan of this display versus a typical 5K monitor? Seems like a situation where the screen panel would be perfectly fine over time, but the supporting software or processor might render the display obsolete. I will also just state, we got multiple questions about this where Adam was the only person who did not use the phrase, uh, like, what is it? When, like, when when you, when Apple were, like, apparently are killing products. Like planned art- obsolescence? Planned obsolescence or artificial I, obsolescence, people were yeah. saying that, was, that they were doing to the studio displays by doing this. So I just wanted to get um, your opinion on that. What do you think? Uh, no. Okay. Uh, let me expand the look, it's not doing anything like the a-, a series chip in the studio display is managing stuff that it can manage in 20 years because it, it, the software, not having a software update for the a series chip is not going to affect that. It, it's, it's putting something on a screen. It, there's no UI. It's, uh, it's doing center stage, you know, it's doing camera processing. That's basically all it's doing. And that doesn't require it to be up to date with the latest and greatest. So, no, I, I just, it's not an iOS device. And the work that it's doing, because this is the truth of any device, like if you don't update the software and you keep using it, a computer from the 90s that's still running OS 8 <laughs> and Microsoft Word 5 is just as fast today as it was then. Because it's just doing what it was doing then. Physics haven't changed. Right. It's the same. That's the deal with the studio display. It, it's this. It's just going to be the same. It it will stop getting iOS updates eventually, and all that means is that if there were any tweaks they were going to do to like the camera or whatever, they'll stop. But I don't like. No, that's a high confidence. No, it's not an issue. Okay. Yeah, I, that's a good point that you make. That like, it's been doing it. Like the, the the device has been doing what it's supposed to be doing, it's not like receiving a video signal is going to change in a meaningful way frequently, you know. Like if we go to like eight K one twenty, right? Like maybe it's going to need something else, but to just but continue it's a new doing panel, what then. you've yeah, but like to continue it's a new doing. Panel, but this yeah. The, the, the conversation here, I mean, because in the chat they're saying like, oh, but they would still need to make A13s. Yeah, but that's not the conversation. The conversation is I buy one of these 
is it going to be obsolete faster because it's got an A13 in it or whatever? And the answer is no, because it's got it and it's doing what it's going to do. The panel's not going to change. Panel's not going to get upgraded. Maybe they'll tweak some of the center stage stuff. Maybe they won't, but like it's irrelevant. And I'll also point out something that came up in the chat, which is all of these things have embedded systems. This one's just a different kind of embedded system. And this goes back, I think, a little bit to uh, all of us who are tech nerds who know about the inner dealings of Apple and its chips and its what it's embedding in its monitors and all of that. But like all these displays have stuff in them. This is just a little bit weirder and more forward. But like in the end, they're going to last forever because the panel, you know, and if the electronics fail, sure. But the a lot, I had a TV where the electronics failed. Like that does happen, but it's not going to change the lifespan at all. It's it's a it's a display. That's it. It's all all it ever will be is what it is now. They could stop updating the software now and that would be fine. All right. Next question. And I'll ask up great segment today. It comes from <laughs> Elliot, last name withheld. Kalen, says, probably. I do, well, I don't know. Because I doubt it because of the way that this is about to go. So Elliot, last name withheld, says I've been working my way through the Flophouse back catalog. And oh, tonight, I was okay. on episode Probably number 264, <laughs> the Emoji Movie, live from five years ago. Live from At, San Francisco. Maybe. I don't know. We'll find out. At the end of the show, the hosts were taking questions from the audience when a person mm-hmm. identifies himself as Jason, last name withheld, and starts asking a question about movie sequels. I do a double take. The voice yeah. sounds familiar. I rewind uh-huh. to hear the name again. Could it be? Is that my podcast buddy, Jason Snell? Elliot? You got me. Yeah, I'm Jason, is. last name withheld from the Emoji Movie Live episode of The Flophouse, my favorite podcast of all time, recorded live in San Francisco. And we went and uh, I asked a question that they I don't remember the answer to. I should go back and listen. It was basically about sequels. And I wanted to know what was a great movie that you loved that never got a sequel, but you felt like it could have had one. I thought that was a clever question. Um, I don't know if they had answers or not. They didn't seem to understand my question. I was <laughs> very excited to talk to them. Yeah. Uh, got to meet them afterward. Uh, and, and it was great. But yeah, that's me. That's me. Um, love the Flophouse. And I got to go see them live. And I hope when they come back to San Francisco again real soon, guys, right, right, that uh, I will get to go again. Are they do are they doing tours again? Because I know they were doing like yeah they did they just did two shows in L.A. Right. so um, they're back on the road. Live podcasts, quite the thing. It's happening. If you would like to send in a question of your own for Ask Upgrade on a future episode, just go to upgradefeedback.com and you can send us in your questions there, but also your feedback and your follow up. If you want to find Jason's work, go to sixcolors.com. You can hear his shows here on Relay FM and at theincomparable.com. You can hear me on Relay FM too and check out my work at cortexbrand.com. We're on Mastodon. Jason is at jsnell on zeppelin.flights. I am imike on mike.social. You can also find the show as upgrade at relayfm.social. You can watch video clips of the show on TikTok, Instagram, YouTube, and also full length video episodes published to youtube as well we are at upgrade relay and all of those we're on threads i am at imike i am yke jason is at j snell j s n e double l thank you to our members who support us of upgrade plus thank you to our sponsors the fine people over at oracle factor zocdoc and expressvpn for their support of this week's episode but most of all thank you for listening until next week say goodbye jason snell Come on, Pentium! <laughs> <laughs>